<laughs> you ready? All right, we're good. All right, let's get it. Are uh, you ready too? I'm ready. All right. Count to three? Yeah. Oh, you guys are already recording, huh? Yep. We're good. Oh. All right. You ready then? I'm ready, dude. All right. This is Reform Raza. My name is Martin Velasquez alongside with my brothers. This is Justin Corona. And what up, everybody? This is Brother Vic. And you are now in the mix. Don't forget to hit us up at reformraza.com, reformraza at gmail.com with any questions, comments, concerns, or rebukes. You can hit us up right there. And don't forget to uh, hit that five-star like button on Apple Podcasts. Five-star. Five-star. I want to make that clear. <laughs> and we can find us anywhere on wherever you're, you listen to podcasts, on Stitcher, on Google Podcasts, on Spotify, on every uh, platform that you, you got, go ahead and search Reform Raza. We'll be right there. Gracias to the listeners who are on Stitcher, on Google, on Podbean. Uh, we see y'all. We see y'all. So thank you for, for tuning in. And so today, man, we're going to get it in today. I'm excited for this episode because this is the culmination of the TULIP. We've been going through it um, Total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement. That was a good one. Irresistible grace, and now the perseverance of the saints. And to me, this is something that I hold near and dear to my heart because let me just tell you a quick story before we get it in. I remember uh, I was at work, and I was, you know, on break. I was, I went to a store to get something to eat with my partner, and I was waiting for him. And I was just outside, and I was just, you know, reading scripture on my phone, and you know. I ran into Romans 8, where it says, you know, whom he calls, he also, you know, chose and predestined that, that Romans 8.38. And I just remember thinking to myself, man, I'm saved. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm good with God. He has the work that Jesus Christ has done in my life. I know that it's something that cannot be taken away because it's not something that I earned or it's not something that, that I did for myself. It's completely, I'm completely lenient on the work, on the finished work of Jesus Christ himself. And so I remember just reading that. I was like, I, I, I got filled with joy, and, you know, during that break time. And I just, I just remember that, that I, just, I just knew. I just knew that this salvation that, I, that the Lord has given me is something that cannot be taken away. And so as we tackle this very important doctrine, man, uh, we got some very special guests uh, with us tonight that are going to help us uh, move through this doctrine and Justin do the honors of introducing our very special guest. So we have some guests here. I, I know you have heard the saying, better out the attic than the basement. <laughs> but here, we know that it is better to be in the basement. And and you know what? What, 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 what better name than the basement? So we have the basement here with us, our, our brothers from the basement. Good That's us coming in, brothers. Yes, yeah. sir. Yes, sir. Good to be with y'all, man. Y'all get one of those just because I like that new Rats and Grace album, man. Yes, <laughs> sir. <laughs> That's what's up, man. Thanks for having so, us. Man. Yeah, appreciate it, man. Yeah. We got Pastor Lowe's and Brother Wayne right yeah. here with us. Yeah. And so, well, just to get it popping right here, um, uh, just give us an intro, uh, who you guys are, uh, what you guys do, uh, just so the, the audience is familiar with who you guys are, whoever wants to start first. Yeah, uh, my name is Pastor Lowe's. Uh, I pastor a church here in Lancaster City called Christ Alone Fellowship. Uh, you know, we've been here for a little over a year now here in the, in the city, and uh, God has been gracious to us, man. Um, you know, we got a spot. It's a dope spot right in Center City. And uh, God is just bringing us people from all sorts of backgrounds, man. And uh, what we're doing right now is that we're preaching through the gospel of John. Mm. Um, you know, we're in John chapter 14. We started in John right. chapter 1, verse 1. We do expositional preaching. We glorify Christ. You know what I mean? We're unashamedly <clears throat> reformed. Uh, you know, just want to exalt the Lord Jesus uh, every Sunday and every day. Um, and so God has been gracious to us. And... Uh, yeah, man. Um, church planning and just discipling and doing all sorts of things to be able to uh, preach the gospel in our city, man. And God has been gracious to us. So 
Yeah, uh, I'm married. Been married 21 years. Got three kids, there man. You go. Don't forget that part. Yeah, right. you know what I'm saying. Right. Shout out to my wife. Uh, and actually, all my kids are out the house. We're empty nesters. You know what I'm saying. So I'm an old head Damn. right now. You know. So that's how it is. But I love my wife. Love my kids, man. Love my church family, and most importantly, love the Lord Jesus, man. All by His grace. Amen. You know what I mean. Amen. 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 That's right. you, you look real young, though, um, brother, because I ain't, I ain't seen no gray hairs in that beard. Yeah, man. they're you, coming you out young. though. You know, they, they're <laughs> here and there. But you know, by God's grace, bro. You know, what I'm saying uh, I'll continue. <laughs> Word, word. He, he, he dyes his beard. No, no, I don't do it. Come on, man. No, I don't do that, man. Oh, man. Oh, man. No, hey, uh, my name is Wayne. Um, I'm co host of the basement here. I am married. I'm going to start off with that. I'm married, happily married. Uh, five years now. Um, we have uh, three kids between us, and they are right at the teenage stage. So, um, mm. that's a blessing. You guys, if you have <laughs> kids around that age, you know what I mean? That's a blessing. Um, so, you know, uh, let me see. I, I attend the church. I help minister at the church. I do what I can at the church. Um, uh, pastor Los is my pastor. So, um, oh, nice. yeah, it's a blessing that we can even do the podcast together. We, we kind of use the basement as a platform where, we could talk about topics that are going on that that are dealing with what's going on in culture. Um, I mean, our our slogan is the basement where theology meets the thoughts of life. So we kind of deal with all three of those things: theology, random thoughts that might come to mind and and, and come up, and then culture. Of course, we deal with um, life, life, and just everything that happens with with uh, within social media on the news uh, headlines everywhere. So it's great to yeah. be with y'all today. Um, Reform Raza. What does that mean? The Reform Raza part. Raza, man. Raza. Raza part. Well, yeah, Raza. You got to say it with the Raza. You got to yeah. <laughs> So Raza, so we're, we're Mexican-American. We're Chicanos, man. So Raza is just a word that Mexicans use to, to say, to call um, our people. You know what I mean? Raza. You're, you guys are Raza. You guys are people who are like us. So we'll, we'll call each other, hey, you know. Um, raza it means you were we're all you know one one race mm. and we, that's typically what we use to you know refer to each other but reform raza i i got it from first peter uh two nine where it says you're you're a royal you're a chosen race a royal priesthood you know a people uh, you know called to proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of the darkness into the marvelous light so what we are is where we, it's a play on where raza, where, where, where Hispanics used to refer to each other, but we're talking about the Christian raza, the Christian race, the Christian united people of God. And so we, we're also reformed. So it's the Reformed Raza podcast. That's what's nice, up. That's nice. what's up. Um, oh. We do the basement through Wrath and Grace, which what that, that kind of came about. We wanted to do a podcast right here where we live in Lancaster, PA, and we wanted to talk about like just local things that are going on. And Wrath and Grace, you're cool with Johan, right? And yeah. he hits you up like, yo, would y'all like to do it on the Wrath and Grace platform? Yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, we wanted to address local issues, you know what I'm saying? Uh, we saw a lot mm -hmm. of podcasts of, you know, uh, a lot of people preaching, a, you know, a word of faith doctrine, you know what I'm saying? And mm -hmm. there was a lot of yes and amens going on uh, through the comment section. It was breaking my heart. So I was like... We got to do something, you know, to give our people a biblical perspective, you know. And so I wanted to take it another level. That's why we have the lights and the mics and all that just to make it, uh, you know, a good experience for people and give them quality. Uh, and God has been gracious to us, man. And so it kind of spilled over into wrath and grace. And now we have a broader uh, people listening, more people listening than locally here. But mm -hmm. we started off by wanting to refute error. You know what I'm saying? We we mm -hmm. we just our hearts were breaking for what people were saying and how many people were amending everything they were saying. It was like we can't just sit by and watch false doctrine kind of like being uh, applauded. We we wanted to just show people that we can talk about issues, but from a biblical perspective. You know, yeah. so that's kind of like how everything started there. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think on a similar note, too, that that's pretty much how it started over here as well. Um, yeah, because um, 
when Ligonier puts out their state of theology, the the um, the survey, uh, I was reading that in 2018, and same same response, you know, broke my heart that you know a lot of people who profess to be Christians don't really hold to an orthodox view of Christianity, mm. and so then you know right here on the West Coast, uh, we have a lot of the same thing, you know, word of faith and, and a lot of amens and and uh, not really thinking critically about mm. their faith. Mm. So you know, just you know, being in amongst brothers and sisters, a lot of struggles came because of a lack of biblical doctrine. Mm. So, like, if they were just assured, not only in in the salvation that Jesus Christ gives, but in the sovereignty of God, knowing that we belong to him, and he works all things for the good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So if they were even just grasp a little bit of that, then a lot of things that that they go go through wouldn't be so heavy. There would be a peace knowing that God is with them and for them, you know what I mean? So, um, you know, that's why we did this thing to here too, you know, to review error and to just, you know, ha- have people thinking a little bit more critically about their Christian faith, you know? Well, yeah, we have, we have a saying here. It's called a, a glorifying God through the edification of the saints. Yeah. And so that, that that's, that's our, our purpose right here is to give God the glory, but also to his elect so that they may be edified and grow in their faith. And that, and just like how you said, not just, just, just to say amen, just to say amen, but actually know the Bible that you're holding, God's word, know yeah. what He says. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I know. I know you guys. I'm yeah. sorry. Go ahead. What reason? I was gonna say before we get into the episode, uh, does Scranton is Scranton a city over there in Pennsylvania? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of, uh, <laughs> I know where you, I know where you're going with this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is, it is. Scranton is in PA. Yup, it's real. Oh, okay, I always wondered that. I didn't know. I should have googled it. But uh, all, all our listeners over here, man, y'all know that's a real place now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, real yeah. quick, real quick, before we get deep with the uh, topic, um, I heard you say, and and I think we agree on this too, like. Our podcast is for people who maybe they're a little bit scared to get into theology. And it's like, yeah. mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. never be scared of uh, getting deep into theology. It just literally means studying the things of God. Um, mm-hmm. I was, I was yeah. reading John 17 earlier uh, when Jesus was praying to the Father. And he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is the the kicker right here. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Mm. And I just when I see that, it, it helps me understand that part of knowing God is studying theology. So studying mm-hmm. theology, understanding who more and more who God is, that's part of eternal life. So that's not something we should run from. That's God's plan for all Christians is to know him more and yeah. more. Mm. Amen. Amen. And also, you know, doctrine is a word that that you doesn't people don't like to use. You know, I mean, nah, I don't I don't want doctrine. I don't I don't want that. I mean, doctrine just literally means teaching, you know, like you don't want the teachings of the Bible, but even, you know, Paul wrote um, to Titus, but as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine in Titus 2.1. You know, so we, <laughs> right. we do have a, a sound teaching, and that's, that word doctrine is a biblical word, yeah. just like predestination, election. These are, pre, these are biblical words that, as you said, we shouldn't be afraid of, that we should be able to articulate as Christians, because this is not a, just a, a, like a, you know, a dumb faith. You know, this is a sound faith that we can actually you know, uh, talk about and articulate and be able to understand and have knowledge, but not just knowledge that stays in the head. In the head. It needs to go to our heart so that it may be expressed in worship. Amen. That's, that's the purpose of that. Amen. Amen. So let's get it in, man. Yes, sir. Right, I, you, the listener, I mean, this is the, the, the fifth, ep- oh, not the fifth, uh, the sixth episode. I mean, we started with the misconception episode of Calvinism, but um, as we end the 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 the, the, um, the the five points of Calvinism, here the perseverance of the saints, how this just ties everything together. So I hope you guys, I mean, just as the the name, you guys persevere through this episode. It might be long, might be short. I don't know, <laughs> only but God uh, <laughs> only God knows. But uh, with that, 
let us first um, establish a foundation. Perseverance of the saints. What does that mean? Hmm. So, uh, Pastor Los, go ahead and if you can give us uh, that definition, if you will. Yeah. Um, perseverance of the saints, uh, it's about being secure in Christ, you know, and, and that God through his grace preserves us in salvation only by grace and that he will lose none you know uh that we will persevere but uh i like the word preservation uh and i think a lot mm -hmm. of us do because it highlights the fact that it is god who preserves not the saint who perseveres you know what i'm saying so the saint perseveres because of being preserved you know what i mean and so by god's grace uh, by his favor and his favor alone, we're able to persevere to the end because of him preserving us uh, in salvation for his glory alone. And, and, and that's a so that's solely a work of God alone, you know, and so that that needs to yeah. be said because, uh, again, the, we're, we're going to get into the Arminian view and, and the other views that are out there. Um, it definitely highlights our hands off of our salvation that it's solely a work of God and because it was a work of God alone he alone uh, uh, is responsible for keeping those that he saves and we know that yeah. God is powerful enough you know and he is powerful he's the very definition of power you know what I'm saying who can thwart the hand of God you know uh, who can take any of his elect out of his hand no one and so uh, perseverance of the saints, or like we say, preservation of the saints, is when God secures a believer in Christ to the point of never falling away so that he can be with Christ forever. So. Yeah. Amen. Amen. I'm going to throw in there. I, I read what Karm.org said, and it's, I'm going to throw this in there. It says they will persevere until the time that they die. Christians, Christians persevere because of the grace of God, not because of their own ability to do good or remain faithful, faithful. True Christians are therefore secure, secure in Christ. Our perseverance is not dependent on our ability to keep ourselves in the faith, whether it be by not doing bad things or by doing good things or by keeping ourselves right with God through our faith. Instead, our perseverance is dependent upon God's faithfulness to us, not our faithfulness to him. Amen. Shout out to Matt Slick and calm.org. Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. Listen to that. Good, Good resource. Good, Good resource. brother. Amen. Yeah, I want to read this description from Ligonier Ministries before we get on to, to the Armenian view. It says, the whole purpose of God's election is to bring his people safely to heaven. Therefore, what he starts... He promises to finish. He not only initiates the Christian life, but the Holy Spirit is with us as the sanctifier, the convictor, and the helper to ensure our preservation. And so I got that description from Ligonier and Ministries just to get, a, I mean, this is an important topic right here, perseverance of the saints, because as we're about to look into the other view, it, it, it places, a, the other view places a, a sort of burden in a in in Christian's life. But hmm. knowing that the, saint, uh, the perseverance of the saints is not really up to us to, to keep that salvation, but it's God keeping us through these situations. Just, just like how you said, it's the, the perseveration of the saints. Yeah, right. And so uh, uh, I want to read this description right here about the Armenian view. It's, it's the fifth point on their side, and it's called falling from grace. I mean, that right away sounds like a huge burden on, on the Christian right there. But it says this, this taught that a saved man could fall finally from sal salvation. It is, of course, the logical and natural outcome of the system. If man must take the initiative in his salvation, he must res retain responsibility for the final outcome. Mm -hmm. So, so the, this other side, it's saying it's possible that you can lose your salvation. That's basically what it's saying. It's possible since since, uh, since the Armenian view is basically saying you initiated your own salvation, now it's up to you to, to keep it. Right. And that right away sounds like, uh, like a huge burden on, on any Christian who hears that. Uh, I mean, imagine going to church and the pa a pastor saying, you can lose your salvation. It's up to you to, to hold on to Christ. And then and you just imagine you just going through a church and it's like, man, I'm having a rough day. 
oh man, I can lose my salvation. Right. That's just going to put a huge burden on the believer right there. Yeah, and I think that right. one of the problems with that is it, it's it's saying essentially that you could be unregenerate from being okay. regenerate. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And so that's a problem because mm -hmm. then they have to deal with the fact that what do you do with people who come back? Do they regenerate again? You know what I'm saying? And mm -hmm. so it becomes a logical. Yeah. It just becomes a you know a problem. You know what I'm saying? And and, and it, it's not consistent with the Bible. We don't see that in Scripture. And even logically, you know, when you, when you really think about it, I, yeah. you're unregenerate, or you, you you're unregenerate. You come to faith, you're regenerate, but then you can become unregenerate again. But maybe by your own choice, you can regenerate yourself. You know, it just it falls apart. You know, doesn't yeah. make sense. Yeah. And we don't see that anywhere in Scripture. You know, when we talk about scriptures like Ezekiel 36, when you, and, we, and when he talks about Jesus talks about in John 3 about being born again. So there's 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 no where in Scripture where he, where it says that the heart can become stone again. Mm. Right. You know what I mean? Right. Um, That's a good point. I mean, at least I don't see it. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah it, and and even to oh yeah, go no, ahead. go ahead, brother, go ahead. I was going to say, even too, even in that courtroom scene that, that we see, Jesus pays the debt for such sinner, only to, to go lost again, for the debt to accumulate again. Right. It, it then just undermines the, the, uh, the sufficiency of the blood of Christ. Mm -hmm. Right. The blood, I mean, with, the, with that type of statement and that type of thinking, it is almost saying that that the blood of Christ wasn't enough to keep a person. Right. Yeah. That's good. And that's why I was condemned as heresy. Yeah. But, you know, in early church history. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, I, I would even so throw man, in there. So, so, oh, I'm sorry. I would even throw in there. I would even. I would even throw in there John 10 verses 27 through 29. Mm -hmm. My sheep. This is Jesus speaking to them. My sheep hear my voice. And I know them and they follow me and I give eternal life to them and they shall never perish. They shall never perish <laughs> yeah. and no one shall snatch them out of my hand. No one shall snatch them out of my <laughs> hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all mm -hmm. and no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. So I think it's pretty clear. <laughs> Nobody can mess with God <laughs> or his elect. Exactly. <laughs> I, I hear this a lot with that scripture right there. Uh, somebody would, would, would say, nobody can snatch them out of your hands, but you can. You can let go. You can let go. You can snatch yourself <laughs> out of I mean, that, that just goes contrary to what scripture just said. No man and no one can snatch, <laughs> snatch us out of his hands. No one. Amen. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I. I even heard it said uh, to follow that point even further. Someone said to a lady before she uh, she they said, uh, well, yeah, what? no one can snatch you from the father's hand. But what if you slip between his fingers? And she goes, <laughs> well, I am part. I am. I am part of the body of Christ. So I am one of his fingers. So I can't <laughs> slip from his hand. <laughs> so I just thought that was dope. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So so. Man, so we hold to Sola Scriptura, right? We hold to the Bible is the authority for, you know, faith and doctrine and everything in our lives. And so we must get our, our, our point of view from the Bible. So, you know, we already mentioned John 10. What are some other scriptures that we can point to and, and be like, this, there it is. The scripture says it right there that it's, you know, undeniable that you will... Um, uh, you will persevere into the end because of Jesus Christ. Right. Man, it, it, so it, it, there there are some scriptures that people are going to say, oh, yeah, I know that one. But Philippians 1, 6, right? I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day mm. of Jesus Christ. You know, so that's that's pretty clear, you know. Uh, and then 1 John two nineteen, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us, you mm -hmm. know. And so that's also important. Um, John 10, like a brother uh, quoted, I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. John 5, 24, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me 
has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, it says, but has passed from death to life, you know? And so those are a few, but uh, the one I really like to highlight to people that I've done before when I'm walking through people through the doctrines of grace is actually in John 6, you know, right out of the mm -hmm. mouth of Christ, you know, in verses 37 through 40, right? Um, where he mm -hmm. says, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out, right? But I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Mm. And this is the will of him who sent me. Now he's talking about the will of the Father, that I shall that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me. That's mm. his will, but raise it up on the last day. Mm. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have which have means possess eternal life and I will raise him up on the last day. And I like how actually the new American standard says it in verse 40. It says, for this is the will of my father that everyone who beholds the son and believes in him will have eternal life. Cause the word should in the ESV is actually not in there. You know what I'm saying? So the word have is important. The word have means right. possess. They have it. And then he says, he will raise them up, whoever the father has drawn to the son, he will raise them up on the last day. He didn't say he might. Yeah. He said he, he he will. You know what I'm saying? And so I walked, uh, this is a good verse because when you start beginning to unpack it, you have to ask the question, who are those that are being given, you know, uh, to the son? Mm. Well, it's those whom the father has drawn to the son. And he's saying, I will never cast them out. And I will raise them up on the last day. He's going to keep them. He will lose nothing of all that the father has given him. You know what I'm saying? And yeah. so right there you see perseverance of the saints very clearly. And you also see preservation. He will lose none. You know, and so it's just very clear, you know, that the, the work of salvation and the work to keep it is all the work of God. You know, and so it's it's just clear. I don't know how people cannot believe this and just look at that passage and say yeah you know i don't know about that no it's very clear in the passage <laughs> yeah yeah you know? yeah so i i got a question for you real quick um you as a pastor as you know um you know you have a, you have a responsibility to the flock to the congregation have you ever had anybody who has had that view of you know you can lose your salvation you know when you know how do you deal with someone you know personally when they're kind of like on that on the Armenian view and you know how how would you walk them through it yeah so i actually have a sister in our church who came from a church that was uh pastored by a woman you know so mm. the, the church had a woman pastor and of course they have you know a charismatic you know pentecostal view of salvation their soteriology you know it's, you can lose your salvation yeah. um so what I did with her was just ask her diagnostic questions, you know, talk about what salvation is. You know, how, how does God save someone? And then she says, well, if someone receives them, if, if someone receives Jesus, they, they can be saved. And I said, okay, let's step back a little bit. Let's go to Ephesians chapter two and talk about our condition prior to salvation. Right. Mm. And so they began to see that we were completely dead, that we were completely unable to respond to God's grace. Right. And so I, so one thing I do is show them our inability to do anything for our salvation. We were completely dead prior. We were deserving of God's wrath. Right. And so then they begin to mm -hmm. see total depravity. They begin to see that mm -hmm. we were totally unable to 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 do anything for salvation. And once she sees that very clearly, then I begin to unpack election. You know what I'm saying? I begin to unpack election and show her how it was a work of God from the very beginning to save you. You know what I'm saying? And so it was already destined in God's, uh, you know, infinite mind for you to be saved. Hmm. And then I show her what, what what's the cross. You know what I'm saying? Let's talk about the cross. What was the work on the cross about? And she'll, you know, I begin to show her how God specifically died for his people. You know, the atoning work that he did. And then I show that very fact of God overwhelming her resistance, how, you know, um, she could try to resist all she wants, 
but God's going to overwhelm her with grace. You know what I'm saying? And he's going to awaken her to grace and for, for her to be able to, you know, to, you know, kind of like the biblical term is to know Christ, you know, to know him as Savior and Lord. Mm -hmm. And then, I, you know, since God did all that work, I begin to show her how because he did all that work, he's going to keep you. He didn't go through all that work for nothing just to lose you. He's going to keep you after that work. And so once I begin to unpack all these things, they, they get it. And I walk through scripture with them. And then it's the most freeing thing, man. Honestly, they're freed from keeping their salvation. They're freed from legalism. You know, they're free exactly. from, you know, all that. And so you begin to see freedom right afterwards, man. And, and then they start reading their Bible properly. Then we get into hermeneutics mm -hmm. and all that. But that's that's what I do with some folks and have done here. Um, yeah, it, it, it's cool that you say that because it just reminds me back in um, Numbers 14 when we see Moses interceding for Israel. Mm. Uh, when, when, when God is, is ready to, to, to rid uh, of Israel and, and, and because they continue to turn to the false gods, false idols, yada, yada, yada. But then Moses goes on to say something that will hint at what we call the preservation of the saints, right? He goes on to point out that, Lord, that you have saved these people from slavery. You have brought them out of slavery. More than that, you have led these people um, with, with a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, mm. only to, to destroy them. And, and, and what Moses is, is articulating here is that you're, you're mighty enough to do these things, but if you destroy these people, how will the other people think of you? How will other nations perceive you to be? That you have enough power to save them but not keep them? Mm. And, and, and that's where we get this hint of the keeping power of, of God, that he is not only powerful enough to save people, out of the bondage of sin, but to keep his people as well. Amen. And, and, and I've used this image before in, in, an, in an episode, I forgot when back, but just as much as childbearing, we are not, not us as men, but women give birth <laughs> to children. Right. <laughs> That'd be kind of weird. I mean, I heard, I heard Arnold Schwarzenegger gave uh, birth to a on, baby man. before. Uh, <laughs> I, mean, I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, but, but women give birth to children, um, but they don't leave their children to go and, and, and keep themselves. Mm. And so we see the image that parents preserve the life of this child. And mm. in such a way, our, our Heavenly Father, who has brought us into adoption, will not leave us to fend for ourselves that we may lose it, but instead He will keep us, just as you pointed out in uh, Ephesians 2, that we are His workmanship. Right. That he has called us out from, from being dead in our sin. He has given us life and that we should walk in these good works that he has laid out before us. Amen. That's good. Mm -hmm. Man, and I, I like what you did, uh, Pastor Los. Uh, you took him through the tulip without, you know, calling it the tulip. You know what I mean? <laughs> Practically. Practically, you know what I mean? Because uh, uh, one thing that I have uh, run into a lot is when you use those kind of terms with people who are unfamiliar, it kind of, you know, they get, you know, shut down by it, you know what I mean? Oh, you're a cabinet. Right. And so they, they start getting a little, they put up this wall. It's like, nah, I ain't trying to hear that because of, you know, <laughs> misconceptions. But I, I, like, I like that technique that you use. You take them through everything without naming it. Exactly. You know what I mean? So when they come to re the realization of what it is, they're like, oh, that's what I am. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean. <laughs> that's what it is. Yeah. Yeah, man. I, you know, <laughs> I, 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 think, I think you're right. I think we have to do a better job at unpacking these things for people that really are asking real questions you know they they really don't know sometimes they don't know where to start or uh, you know they don't know like the implications of you know losing your salvation you know um that i i really believe like for instance one is pentecostalism is legalistic because simply because they got god wrong and if you have god wrong mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying then everything falls apart you have law and gospel wrong you know, and so that's where you get legalism. And so people are trying to keep something that they can't keep, you know, and maybe something that they don't even have, you know. And so mm. I, I think law and gospel is also essential, 
mm. you know, showing people the law, which shows them how sinful they are and, and how condemned we are and how deserving of wrath we are. But then you bring in the gospel. That's the answer to our problem. Right. And so I think the doctrines of grace really unpack uh, our redemption for us and, and God's grace all over, you know, what he's done in Christ. You know, amen. Amen. And so let's, let's, let's get into the meat of this episode right here, because, uh, you know, um, they, the people who are against, um, this doctrine will hold strongly because they're, they're, they're out there, you know, uh, hold strongly to, you know, you can lose your salvation and they act that they act as this is a fundamental doctrine, you know, that you can lose it. You know what I mean? Someone once told me if I don't believe that, I can't lose my salvation, then I'm in the wrong church. Or I, I can lose, if I don't believe that I can lose my salvation, I'm, I'm in the wrong church. And that kind of did something to me. I was like, man, you hold so strongly to losing your salvation. Wouldn't the opposite be a lot better that that you are kept by the Father? You know, you the Holy Spirit is working and dwelling in you, and Jesus Christ has paid for your sin that the triune God is keeping you. Wait, 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 doesn't that sound a lot better? You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. the one that they will pack their bullets in and shoot at us is Hebrews chapter 6. All right? <laughs> and so let me read it real quick, and I'm going to get your, your guys' input because I'm going to be real. This is a tough scripture on on the outside, right? Uh, from the outside looking in, you look at this like, whoa, you know, what, what, what is it talking about right here? So Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 1 says, Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God and of instruction about washing, the laying on hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the word of God, and the powers of the age to come and then have and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying once again the son of god to their own harm and holding him in contempt so this is the one i've heard a lot that they tried to there you go you know if if you fall away you can't you know no uh, you you can't repent again you know it's impossible for you to repent so I want to get both of you guys' input on this. I want to I want to start off with Brother Wayne uh, because we haven't heard Woo! much of him tonight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Hey, we want to go on to Pastor Lowe, I appreciate man. that, bro. I appreciate <clears throat> that. <laughs> oh man. Oh man. Um, I think, and, and I'm not gonna get very deep into it. I talked to Los beforehand and was like. I'm going to hand that question off to you. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> not that, not, not you're because. Like you're a kid at the doctor waiting to get a shot and you're just hoping they don't call your name. Oh, <laughs> man. Going out right yeah, yeah, you know, I, I you know, I, a lot of times I defer to him when it comes to these type of questions. Not because um, these things have stumped me or anything like that. I understand looking at these uh, questions right here. You just have to look at the context. Who are they talking to? Mm -hmm. What are they talking about? And you'll see the Jewishness of this context. They're talking about Jews that have, uh, you know, they, they want to stay stuck in the legalism. They want to stay stuck in, 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 in everything that they grew up believing in. They, they, they heard the gospel and they're actually wanting to go back. It's very similar to the Galatians. The Galatians heard the gospel and, and, and Paul even said to them, it's crazy who have you been bewitched by? Like, it's crazy how quickly you have turned from the true gospel to the false gospel. Um, and, and and so looking at this right here, I, I know that he it, it, it is speaking to a different audience than most people understand whenever they look at this verse right here. Yeah, it, It's all about context. When he starts off by saying, therefore, let us leave, that's because of, of the things that he was addressing beforehand. And if you go through, you know, the preceding chapters, you'll understand exactly what he's talking about when he gets to chapter six. Yeah. So, yeah, I'll, I'll let, let me throw that first part in there and then I'll come back to it. 
<laughs> yeah, I, I always tell people keep reading, right? Because uh, sometimes yeah. the before and after is important. So if you go to verse 7 um, and 8, you begin to see, uh, you know, I think a, a little hint there to help us out. In verse 7, he says, yeah. for, for land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those for whose sake it is cultivated, receives a blessing from God. Then in verse 8, but if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed, and its end is to be burned. Okay? So, one example I, I like to use when it comes to this passage is Judas. Um, and the reason why I use Judas is because he was considered a disciple. He walked with Jesus. And we know he was a thief from the beginning, right? So, he, he was never really of them. But he was there. He was sent. He shared in the things of God, you know. Uh, so in this right here, what we have is someone who externally like experienced the things of God. You know, you, you could be enlightened. You could taste of the heavenly gift. I'm pretty sure that Judas, you know, enjoyed some of the things that the disciples enjoyed because of Christ, mm. you know, uh, and have shared in the Holy Spirit. I think Judas shared some of the things you know, that Jesus ended up doing. I'm pretty sure he ate some of the fish and loaves that Jesus produced. You know what I'm saying? And heard some of the teachings that Jesus said. Maybe he got some good things out of what Jesus said instead of actually applying it to himself. You know, he saw the po the powers of the age to come in Christ. You know, he saw these things. And I would even say that he shared in them things and that he was amongst them, you know, but he was never of them. And I think that verse seven and eight, you know, in verse seven, we have someone, I believe, you know, uh, he's using, he's using the example of rain that falls on it. It will produce a crop. But then if it bears thorns and thistles, it is it's showing you what how that ground, the condition of the ground and, and what it's going to produce from the rain that falls on it. Mm. If it's not good ground, it won't produce. But if it is, it will produce. Mm. You see, so what we're seeing here is someone who shared, someone who was there, uh, someone who actually saw, uh, you know, but was never of Christ in the first place. He's mm -hmm. proving not to be, uh, not to actually have fruit in the first place. Mm -hmm. Matthew chapter 13, also, uh, also I'll take people there too, where it actually talks about a seed sown in someone's heart, how that can actually be taken as well. <laughs> You know, it talks about the, the seed sown on rocky ground. And this is one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. So this is someone who received the word with joy, yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. So this is someone enduring. But then you mm -hmm. also see when tribulation and persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? So you have someone who actually had the word endured for a while because of it had joy but they fell away you see and so i think that's important and i think judas is a good example of that someone who actually was there with the disciples was one of the 12 but was never of you know of christ and so i believe this is just showing us an external example of someone who's actually in the midst of god's people who enjoys the benefits of it but was never of of god you know what I'm saying? It's kind of like the Old Testament equivalent of somebody being circumcised outwardly. But as Paul said, you were never really of Israel unless you were circumcised inwardly. You mm -hmm. know, and so you do have Old Testament examples of unbelievers enjoying the benefits of God, actually the national blessings of God, but are actually never of Christ in the first place. So I don't that's what I see here, you know, and I think that's a good example for the Hebrew. That externally, mm -hmm. you know, it's not enough to know Christ, you know, so that's how I tackle with it. I just think it's just, it's just an e external example of someone who reaps the benefits, but was never of Christ in the first place. So. Amen. Amen. And I, I would even go to uh, Matthew 7, where, you know, there's there's people that. Is, so let me read it. Matthew 7, 21 says. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, um, and do mighty works in your name? 
And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. So these are people who did have a, a, a partaking in the gifts of, of the Spirit, right? They prophesied, they did work, cast out demons, things like that. But yet Jesus declares that he never knew them. So they were partakers. And I think in Hebrews in, in Hebrews 6, one of the key uh, words right there is they were enlightened. So it, it's not in a salvific sense. They were partakers of what the Spirit of God offers, but they never they were never came to that place of salvation. Yeah. So just as First John says, they were among us, they were part of us, but they were they went out from among us. That so it may be manifest that they were never really of us. They were here. They were in the church. They were clapping their hands. They were you know worshiping and doing all these things as you know as far as church goes. But when it came down to the matters of the heart, they were never right. really regenerated in the first place. Another example so, is um, um, yeah. when, when Paul talks about the unbelieving spouse, right? Like how they're mm -hmm. sanctified. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So uh, an unbeliever could be set apart for godly use also. You know, an unbeliever uh, mm -hmm. who's married to a believer reaps some of the benefits of that believer's faith in the family. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's another example of someone who can enjoy some of the benefits that God gives and not be saved. You know, it's like common grace. Yeah. You know, that, mm -hmm. you know, we all kind of reap benefits. Even unbelievers do. You know, when you have a solid church within a city that loves the Lord, that city's going to reap some of the benefits of that church. You know, so that's a that's a way of sharing yep. that's not salvific, as you said. And I think that's what he's talking about here. You know. Yeah. yeah and and, and I'm. It's almost reminding me again back in um, that time again in Israel. Um, the nation, the, that generation that God had performed these plagues, they wit they were eyewitnesses to the plagues that took um, that were taking place in Egypt, and they witnessed the miracles of God and how He had led them through. But nonetheless, we we understand that even after that whole conversation between Moses and God they did not see the promised land. Yeah. The generation after, after them did. God didn't cut off Israel. Um, Israel continued and did see the promised land, but that generation didn't get to see it. Hmm. So they did partake in the things in, the, in, 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 in uh, what God was doing. And, and just like how you said to your point, there are those people that, are, that have been built on this rocky foundation uh, they may come, they, they go with the flow of the emotion, the experience, but then when a real tribulation comes, a trial, whatever may come their way, they're blown out, and it only goes to prove they were never solid in what they believed in to right. begin with. And just to back that up with Matthew 13, Jesus also talked about, as for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word. And then it, he says, and it proves unfruitful. You know, so it's proving mm -hmm. that it was never fruitful. It, it, it kind of like going back to verses seven and eight of Hebrews six. It's just proving that it's cursed. It's proving that it's deserving to be burned. You know, when rain falls mm -hmm. on it, it doesn't bear any fruit. It's just showing you its condition at the end of the day and i think that's what he's talking about here that if this person actually was saved uh they would never fall away you know they they wouldn't need restoration they, they would have been already restored but they're just proving that they're unfruitful at the end of the day an external experience with god happens all the time you know it, that's who we call nominal christians right they they come to church you know we might even have unbelievers in churches that and even solid churches maybe you know, you could have people serving and not be saved. That could happen, too. You know what I'm saying? And, yeah. and so, you know, I, I think at the end of the day, you know, by God's grace, he keeps us and will prove to be fruitful. But I think Hebrews 6 is talking about someone who has an external experience with God and no internal change, no heart change. Yeah. And, and, yeah. I, 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 oh, were you going to say something? I was just going to say, when it comes to this question right here, can, ele can an elect person fall completely away from salvation i think we got to just keep it nice and simple with them everyone knows john three sixteen. for god so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life and i don't think that can be stressed enough because 
if I'm given superpowers, right? They become part of me. It's, you know, they, they become who I am. And those, you know, when I'm given eternal life, this is life that is eternal. It's like you can just ask them a simple question. It's not short term life. It's not temporary life that we're given. We're given eternal life. So how long is eternal? How long is eternity? Hmm. Amen. Yeah. And I was, I was going, referring back to, to you know, to, to the fruit. It's, it's about being, uh, bearing fruit with keeping with repentance. And so that just reminded me of, of Galatians chapter 5. Because at one time, me too, when I read Galatians chapter 5, I, I didn't see it in its context. I, I didn't see it as, uh, as, as the way that it's meant to. So I saw Galatians chapter 5, and I thought, it, it was a list that, you, that there's things that you you cannot do, like kind of like a like a a burden, like a law again. That's like what Galatians, Galatians. yeah, that's what Galatians is all about. Talking about that the Christian is free in Christ, and to not use your freedom to indulge in the sinful nature, to indulge in your sin, and it gives that list to abstain from sexual immorality, to to not get drunk, jealousy, envy, anger. And then it would go on to say this after after all that list. It says, I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And so at first glance, when I read that, I thought like, oh, you can lose your salvation because uh, if you do one of these things, one of these acts, automatically now you're excluded because uh, uh, you committed one of these acts that, that are on the list. But we did an episode in season one about how, how this is not just a simple list that you have to keep going. And it, it becomes back to, to the law, back to the Ten Commandments. You have to do this, have to do that, have to do that. But as Galatians says that the law was given as a tutor to lead us to Christ, to really truly be set free. And so I saw that as a list, but but it would go on to say that, the, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, gentleness, self-control. And so these are the things that a Christian bears fruit of. This is the evidence of salvation. And so now this this other list, it's not so much as as oh you have to, you can't, you can't, you have to, you have to. It's more like if you see anybody doing this, they're not in Christ. They're not truly set free. They're not have have not been regenerated. And those persons who live in, in that habitual sin will not inherit the kingdom of God. It's right. not saying that all oh, they they were they're saved and then you know they're falling back into sin you know playing hokey pokey with God okay. one foot in one foot out. No, it's saying that those who live a lifestyle of all of these sins, they you can be sure that they will not inherit the kingdom of God because they are not safe to begin with. Mm -hmm. But the true Christian who who, who God uh, uh, persevered who who per, per, uh, preservation that that the, that the Christian is being persevered. Uh, He's going to bear these fruits of the Spirit because the Spirit of God is living inside that Christian. And this is how you can tell a, a true Christian from a fake. It's not saying that that person was, 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 uh, was saved, now he's not. It's saying, no, this person was never saved, and this is evidence of the true Christian right here, that the true Christian is going to bear these types of fruits. All right. Yeah. I, All right. I, I even like to go to Jeremiah thirty-two forty. I will make with them an everlasting covenant that mm. I will not turn away from doing good to them. And I will put the fear of me in their hearts that they may not turn from me. <laughs> like there's a fear of God that God gives <laughs> yeah. us that we won't turn from him. And that's why in the end, all those that are his will come back, even if they fall away for a se for a season. Mm hmm. Hold up. We're having some technical difficulties right now. Hold up. All right, go. we're back. Oh. Sorry, that was a little hiccup right there. But it's all good. So, I mean, so yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I mean, we're going to be, we're at the base our theology on scripture, right? And scripture clearly screams at us since God is the initiator of our salvation, he will ultimately keep us because it's his salvation as, um, David said, uh, take not the joy of your salvation from me. You know what I mean? And, and it's a promise that he made to, to us as well that we can take being his children um, by faith. Um, in Ezekiel 36, right? I will put my spirit in them. I will clean them. And, and he goes on to point out all the eyes that he will do for us. Nowhere does he say, 
um, and you must do these things for me. You must keep yourself. No, he's, he goes on to point how he will uh, lay out this foundation that all of the working of the Christian in redemption to sanctification will all be the work of Christ. He, God will, will build his church in such a way with holy hands. And, and you know, you could take that back to Old Testament as far as building of the temple, but except this will be a better temple. He will be building up his church from the, the temple, the body with holy hands. Mm-hmm. Not that, that us, that we would build ourselves and, and build up our own uh, or, or build our own type of sanctification, but he, through the spirit inside of us, will do that. And more than that, he will give us the desires that we may want to please God in such things that we won't even leave. Amen. Amen. Yeah, I, I like the, the when God, the, that passage you quoted in Ezekiel, how God is the one who takes the heart of stone you know, and, and so what I tell people, so, you know, as far as salvation is you could never replace your own heart, you know, physically. <laughs> Think about it. You know, you can't even do surgery on your own heart. You know, you got to be put to sleep and someone else got to do it. Iron Man can. You know what I mean? So if we can't do that ourselves, I mean, that's just a basic yeah. example. Like, you know, it, it, it takes an external righteousness, an external work from ourselves for us to be changed, you know, so we can never do it ourselves. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Amen. Amen. <laughs> and so... Yeah, man. So uh, something that I always hear also uh, people say, uh, when, whether I'm talking about them, about election, total depravity, whatever it is. So what, man? Are we just puppets then? Is God just playing with us and we're just little toys in, in, in God's hands and he's just doing whatever he wants with us? And since, you know, we emphasize a lot, you know, God and his sovereignty and he's the one that does the salvation and the working and it's all, we give all glory to God and everything, right? So... If God is keeping me, am I just a puppet then? What y'all got to say about that? Yeah. Well, I would say um, we're being sanctified, you know, now that we're saved, we're being set apart. And um, I think what I tell reformed people, especially some some people that are still in the cage stage, you know, like yeah. I have to tell yeah. them, you know, calm them down a little bit and say, hey, uh, obedience is actually something that, you know, God is calling us to do. He's calling us to obey his commands. Yes, it's by his grace, but disobedience is an actual category in reformed thinking. You know, I have to tell mm-hmm. them that, you know, you can disobey God. You know, God uh, convicts you of sin. You can disobey, you know, and so disobedience is real. It happens, you know, mm-hmm. and we, yeah. we at times fall short of what God has called us to do. And so, no, we're not puppets in that sense. You know, we take all the credit for our disobedience. You know what I'm saying? That's what we do well. But we have to give God all the credit for anything in us that does any good. You know, that's where God comes in. And, and any everything that, uh, that we do as far as uh, obedience or anything good comes from God. And I think what we do well is disobey, which can happen to someone who's regenerate. You know, so we're not puppets in that sense. You know, God has given us, I like how James White says it, creaturely will. You know, I don't like to use the word free will because that comes with all, you know, sorts of problems. But the creature mm-hmm. does have will. You know, we can make choices. And sadly, we mm-hmm. make choices that, you know, are, you know, we, we can break God's command. We can not love our wives like we're supposed to or, you know, do certain things. But no, we're not puppets in that sense, you know. And I, I, I would push back on the Arminian view. I've, I've heard my Arminian friends always talk about, you know, that whole uh, puppet terminology. And, you know, like, you know, for instance, some of them actually go into open theism because they have mm. to they have to, you know, keep free will at all costs. And that's what open theism mm-hmm. is. It's to, it's it's to keep and preserve free will at all costs. So God has yeah. to not know the future somehow in order for us to do anything. Because if He knows everything we're gonna do, then there's no free will, mm. which is ridiculous. You know, it, it's like yeah. we can make decisions still as Christians, as believers that are sinful. Um, but like our brother said, we can't live in our sin. We, you know, First John talks about we can't make a practice of sin if we're born again. But we can disobey God, and we have. 
you know, and that's why yeah. we continue to go to him. And so, no, we're not puppets in that sense. We take all the credit for our wrongs and disobedience, but any good that comes from us, we give that to God. You know, he's the one who causes good in our lives. Amen. I, I would say Amen. when it comes down to it, like because of sin, we can't say that we have free will. Our, 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 yeah. our souls, we're, we're held bondage because of sin. Like we're mm -hmm. held, we're held to these standards where it's just like we're evil. We cannot choose good until, until we are set free. And once we are set free in Christ, then from there we're we're free to do good or to do good evil, to to do evil as well. So it's like once we're free in Christ, then we're gonna want to do good because we're gonna mm -hmm. want to serve Christ. So I, I, that's the easiest way that I tell people. Of course, before you are free in Christ, you. You can't choose to do good because you don't want good. You just want evil. Yeah, I, I like the example also of Peter blowing it in Galatians when Paul talked about how he rebuked them openly. You know, Peter got mm -hmm. it wrong. You know, he was an apostle, you know what I'm saying? And so he 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 made a big mistake, you know, and he had to be corrected. And uh, yeah. I don't think it was God causing Peter to, you know, almost fall into another gospel. That's our problem. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so there are things that God decrees. There are things that God wills. You know, he decrees everyone to be holy. Yet, you know, he allows us at times to not to fall short of that. You know what I'm saying? And so I think understanding God's will, his decretive will, his permissive will, those 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 things are helpful in talking about personal responsibility, especially for those of us who are reformed. And especially for those of us who are still in the cage stage, you know what I'm saying? I think yeah. <laughs> I've been there, you know what I'm saying? And it's like, look, man, I've lived long enough now to know that, you know, through conviction, through the Holy Spirit, there are things I'm going to do wrong. And I'm still in need of God's grace. You know what I'm saying? I still need the gospel every day. I need to preach the gospel to myself every day, remembering law and gospel every day, because it's going to show me my inability, but also it's going to show me the beauty of the gospel. You know, that's an everyday mm -hmm. thing. And so, listen, man, we're not puppets at all. You know, it, we're just, a, you know, when it talks to, about the omniscience of God, God knowing all things. Yes, he does. That's just how, you know, that's who God is. Um, but we're still responsible for our choices and the things that we do. God is sovereign, yeah. but we are still responsible. That's right. how you chalk it up to that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and we definitely get um, through reading scripture that, there is a human responsibility to um, obey God and to do things that God has commanded us to do. And one scripture I would go to is Philippians in chapter chapter 2, verse 12. It says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And there's a key one right here. People stop right there. Oh, you got to work out your salvation. You got to do it. The next verse, verse 13 says, For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Amen. So we see we see both of them right there. We see that there is a responsibility for us to obey. Amen. But all the good that is in us, we give all glory to God because it is him, it's actually him who is working in us for his good pleasure. So any of the good, whatever we have, the good works, the, the good things, the, the good that we have, it, it all goes back to God. Yeah. Because it's his spirit working within us. So therefore, I mean, there's a responsibility, but still all glory to God because he's the one that actually is working through us because left to ourselves, we, we're not going to do anything good like that. You yeah. know what I mean? Right. Yeah, yeah. It, it might be a nice song, but it's not a reality, you know. <laughs> I'm your puppet. <laughs> hey, for, for, for all you guys who, who like listen to all these, you, you know what's up. Man, I, I, hey, man. I got my side question real quick. Do y'all bump all these over there on the East Coast? Yeah. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Yeah. I guess, yeah, man. I do. Oh, man. But my oldies might be a little bit newer than y'all's oldies. <laughs> he calling y'all old. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm looking. I'm looking. <laughs> Martin and Los. I can't see my man in the corner. I'm going to guess <laughs> my man right here. We probably the same age, yo. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, yeah, West Coast, man. You know, Cholo oldies and all that kind of stuff, man. Lowriders. All that stuff. We, we, we on that, man. We on that. What's, what's oldies yeah, for y'all? Anyway. What's oldies for y'all? Oh, I'm, I'm thinking like black and white, like that type of oldies. 
Yeah, I'm talking about old school. Not, not the, one where you get, the one that you hear, like, the vinyl sound in the background. Oh, the... Nice, yeah, man. Nice. All of that. All of that. <laughs> um, so, yeah, man. So, uh, we, 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 we talked uh, about a lot of things tonight. And, um, I, Justin, I think you answered this question earlier. Why is it vital for God to keep his people? And you made the reference about yeah. Moses and then the reputation God will have. Like, he was strong enough to, to deliver them out of Egypt, but not strong enough to keep them. So, I think... I mean, in that sense, it is vital uh, for God to keep us for his own glory, for his own name's sake. Exactly. You know what yeah. I mean? And our glory to God in that. So as we begin to, you know, wrap it up real quick, what is an application of this doctrine that we can use personally? So how can we personalize, internalize this and not be so like a uh, cage stagey or anything <laughs> like that? Um, you know, how can we internalize, you know, just you know, either the tulip in general or the per, uh, perseverance of the saints. How 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 does this? How is this supposed to go into our heart? Yeah, but I tell people with the doctrines of grace that what they're supposed to produce is humility. Mm. You know, yeah. it's, it's by grace. You know, and uh, that's what I try to help people understand when they're when when their introduction to reform theology is the way it is. Sometimes, unfortunately. I try to bring them back to the fact that God did, doesn't need you. You're not that, mm -hmm. you know, like you were dead. You were dead in your sin. Um, and so I, I, one way to uh, practically, like, apply this is to go back to basics and realize how holy God is, how evil we were, you know, and how sinful we can be, and humble yourself. Go to God before prayer, remembering that you, the privilege even to pray before a holy God is given to you by grace, you know. Um, and so it should affect your prayer life. Uh, you should forgive anyone, uh, remembering the forgiveness that was given to you. When you're going through the doctrines of grace, you begin to really unpack redemption and how God has forgiven us of a crime that was deserving of eternity and separation from him. You know what I'm saying? So when you begin to unpack these doctrines, man, it should produce humility. It should always produce, like, you know, this this awe that God would even choose me, mm. you know, in spite of me, you know? And so mm. it, it should just break you, man. It should just break us to humility, to prayer, to worship, you know? And I think that's something we need a little bit today. You know, the, the, the world is so loud everybody's loud and angry everybody's like feeling privileged like we deserve things it's like no we don't deserve yeah. anything man when i go before god and worship the very fact that he accepts my voice and anything i got to say it took the son of god to die on the cross for that to be possible so that's how i internalize it i you know i i think about it every day man and i get broken by it then i start remembering those that offended me or maybe i'm struggling with forgiving a brother you begin to forgive quickly man when you realize the forgiveness that was given to you and i think always going to the cross always going before god remembering the doctrines of grace that should produce uh, a graciousness in the believer's life i think that's uh, a way to apply it man remembering what god has done for you yeah yeah um amen i would even throw in there like uh if God is contradicting himself in the word. If on one hand, we had all these scriptures that we brought up where God is saying, you know, if you come to me, I will never turn you away. Those who are mine, they will all come to me. I will not lose anyone. You won't be able to, you know, turn from me because I will place a fear in you. And then on the other hand, you're one of those people that believes also that the Bible talks about you can lose your salvation. It's double mindedness. God's word yeah. is on the line. If God is contradicting mm -hmm. himself, then that means that other attributes aren't right as well. That means not only mm -hmm. uh, is, you know, uh, attributes like his truthfulness on the line then his faithfulness will be on the line. His his goodness would be on the line. Um, his holiness his sovereignty, even knowing who's his and who's not his, his omniscience is on the line. Um, mm. All of these things, if you just go through the attributes of God, these things are on the line. And these things should be questioned if God is, is, is contradicting himself in the word. So we have to praise him. We should be in all. We should be humbled because God is truthful throughout all his word. Amen. 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 
And I think when it comes to application, I, I see two points too that that we as as a believer can take away, and and maybe even um. Oh, hold on. Sorry, I froze again. But as far as something like two points that we can take away, first I see is the believer has hope. Mm. Um, at the end of this, we have hope for other um, people that come to faith because we know that faith can only happen if the word is preached. Mm. Mm. And through that, if we have this understanding of how God preserves people to himself and will keep them, we have this hope that when the word is ministered to a person, if we see them come to repentance, whether we, whether we see that as genuine or not, because we don't see the heart, we have a hope that if this is legit, if this is true, God will keep them. I don't need to be with this person 24-7 to just keep track and make sure this person is saved. I have a, a, an assurance with Christ that he will keep his people. And I think that that should bring an assurance to a pastor if he understands this, that, that he doesn't need to, uh, what, I, I guess, fall into that, that mode of legalism, right? Don't do this, don't do that, and, and you'll be able to keep yourself. But it said, have full assurance in the power of the Holy Spirit that he will keep the people that come to the congregation, whomever, whoever it may be, and that, his, and, and that it will lighten the load for the pastor in that area that... Um, that he could rest assured that God will start a work and that he'll also see it to completion. And then a second point I see that, that can be applied. Um, and, and um, I mean, you guys could correct me if I'm wrong, but this also brings, if this, if this is understood correctly, this can be brought to a church when it comes to, um, expelling people from the church. And I say that only because this highlights the importance of how God works for his name's sake. Hmm. So if we understand that God um, will preserve his people for himself, well, as far as when it comes to church government or politics, whatever you want to call it, when we see believers in the congregation with us or people that we um have a profession of faith within our congregation, when we see that they are living in habitual sin, we need to be able to go through the steps, as Jesus pointed out, to, to address it, to bring it amongst a, a, a small group, and then if, if still not um, heeding the word of correction, bring it before the church. And if not, cast them out. Why, why, that, why that may be applied here is because if they continue, if a church doesn't practice church discipline in such a way, it will tarnish the name of, of God. And so then it will, it would only um, taint this idea that God doesn't preserve his people. And that's why I think if, if church discipline is done correctly in such a way that, that, that when um, it gets to that point, and sadly, if, if it does have to get to that point, that people can understand that this person was not of us because they have not followed in the discipline as, as far as when it comes to um, sin and correcting sin in repentance, however it may be. But nonetheless, we're not going to excommunicate them from our lives, but we're going to treat them as an unbeliever. And how do we treat unbelievers? We preach the gospel to them. Hmm. And, yeah. and I think and, and that's why I could see where it could be applied in, in both different ways. But, I mean, if, if you guys... Um, I think you're referring to 1 Corinthians... Five five, where it says you are to deliver this man, this man who was in habitual sin, yeah. uh, to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. So all for um, the good of his soul, so that you know the, the flesh can be destroyed, so that you know you can come to that full repentance. Yeah, because ultimately the the world watches the church, and if church discipline is not um, practiced the world will see the Christian today who continues in such things um, and, and, you know, sadly will judge God according to the person. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah, and, man. and even excommunication, when, you know, someone is kicked out like that, it's in the hopes that they may come back. So it comes right back Amen. to the perseverance of the saints. 
So exactly those that are truly those that are truly of the elect, they will come back even after being excommunicated. Yeah, it's gonna be just the hope. Yeah, there's gonna be judgment for churches that don't practice church discipline because of what you're saying, brother. Like if if you know, because you're not preserving the gospel at that point. Mm-hmm. You know, you have a carnal mm-hmm. church. You know, it's no longer a church. Um, so, and you're not giving that person their best chances at you know repenting if you're enabling Mm -hmm. you know so like church discipline is a big deal we do that at our church um you know and uh by god's grace it hasn't happened yet um but it's a very tough thing you know i'm saying we've done it before at the previous church plan i planted that was one of the hardest things we've ever seen done you know like my brother i had to separate from my brother from someone that i love someone that i discipled you know what i'm saying that was the hardest thing i've ever done and a sister that we love you know it was very hard but the beauty of it is that they actually came to repentance you know they came back and they came Mm -hmm. back into Mm -hmm. fellowship they apologized to the congregation you know but the gospel at the end of the day was preserved you know, people got to see restoration. They got to see correction. They got to see all these things. Church discipline is a lot of work, man. But, you know, um, if if you love the Lord, if you love people if, and you want want to maintain gospel witness, uh, it's well worth it. You know, and it's, it's yeah. it, we need to do it. For sure. Amen. 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 So, I mean, as we begin to wrap up, man, um, Everything that we spoke in, you, the listener, man, taking consideration the things that we spoke here today, um, dig into the scriptures, you know, like we always say, man, don't take what we say, don't take what your pastor says at face value, do the work that needs to be done, and be a Berean, search the scriptures to see whether these things are so. Uh, don't trust us, don't believe us. <laughs> go do the work, go dig in, and, and, and let the Lord reveal himself to you. Um, so thank you, uh, brothers, for for hopping on this episode with us, man. Uh, it was a it was a blessing, man. You guys were a huge uh, encouragement, and you know it was just it was dope to just chop it up with you guys and do a little episode. Go ahead and plug your guys self right now. Where can they find you on social media? Where can they listen to your guys' podcast? Go ahead and plug that thing in. Yeah, man. Facebook dot com uh, slash Wrath and Grace. Uh, we go on every week. Uh, we flip flop every week. One week we'll do Wednesday, <laughs> the other week we'll do a Monday. But uh, that's because on Wednesdays, on on one of the Wednesdays, we have our men's group. So we want to be committed to our church first uh, <laughs> before a podcast. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So right. we have we have our men's group, and so the the week we have it on Mondays, we have our men's group on that Wednesday. But every other Wednesday, then uh, we'll be on. So. Allow me to shamelessly nope. plug real quick. So every almost every almost every episode, I try to find episodes that because we're like, what, 60 some episodes in now. And we've dealt with some of these topics a couple times, even if it's briefly. So um, episode 20, once saved, almost saved. We dealt with whether the Bible says you can actually lose your salvation. Episode 44, we dealt with, you know, God bringing uh, a sinner uh, uh, back alive and you know we dealt with episode 44 grace alone episode 48 and 51 faith alone part one and two we dealt with all of the solas so <clears throat> episode 52 christ alone episode 56 scripture alone episode 60 glory glory of god alone and in episode 44 we had matt slick on and we dealt with um god's sovereignty um, we dealt with election, predestination, predetermination. We dealt with a whole lot. So like that question yeah, on yeah. on on the puppet and all that, are we just puppets used <laughs> by God? We dealt with that in episode 45. So shamelessly plug in right there. <laughs> amen. amen. Go ahead, yeah. Joy. And that was a dope episode. I listened to that episode with Max Lake. I was like, man, man he's a straight shooter. He yeah, really bro, he don't play. Ready. Yeah. And brothers, yeah, we yeah, want to yeah, have yeah. you guys on. You know what I'm saying? We want to yeah. encourage you. You know, keep doing what you do. You know what I'm saying? The Lord will bless it, and he already has. And uh, we want to yeah, have man. you on, man. So we got to talk afterwards. But um, God bless of y'all, course. man, and everything that you're doing out there, man. We need it. Straight, straight up. Amen, straight up, amen. Straight up. Appreciate y'all. Yeah. Appreciate y'all, man. 
And um, so uh, go ahead and hit us up, reformraza.com, reformraza at gmail.com. With any questions, comments, concerns, or rebukes, you can hit us up right there. Don't forget to hit that uh, five-star button on Apple Podcasts. Go ahead and like the episode, share the episode, share your thoughts, leave us a voicemail in the description below. You can hit that button and leave us a voicemail, and we'll play your voicemail over the air. So I just, you know, I just want to say thank you to the listeners. Now, uh, y'all have been faithful. We've been, you know, slowly growing uh, these past couple of months. So I just want to uh, give a shout out to the listeners, man. Y'all, y'all, y'all faithful. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, uh, so shutting down. This is Reform Raza. We do this to glorify God through the edification of the saints. Grow as we grow. Raza, Raza. I like that. (laughs) 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 There you go. Amen. God bless (laughs) y'all. Stop button.